So I'm going to jump into the nearest TSO performance and caveats. And again, this is a huge team effort. Uh, I'm the one presenting it here, but you know, Lloyd Albert has been a huge, a huge part of this. Uh, Rene Doyon himself did analysis on this, which were very, very useful. Peter Roy, Kevin Folk, Joseph Filipasso, nearest team, and of course the TSO working group uh, at SDSCI, included Everett, which was and uh, Jerome with the feedback uh, on all on all these TSOs was was fundamental. Um, for the nearest TSO, it's basically the same story at, at, at the bottom, oh, sorry, at the at the high level, six hour time series observation. Target was happy 14B with nearest sauce and sauce strip 256. Uh, these are almost 600 integrations, six group per integration, and this is very important. The last group actually saturates on this data set, and this was done by design. We wanted to go in the whole, in the entire dynamic range of the detector with these observations and see, you know, what we could find out of this. So this is something to have in mind when you're analyzing this data, uh, that there's a portion in the peak of the blaze function in order one, I'm gonna show it, that saturates. Um, one interesting thing that you're seeing here that you don't see, probably you don't even saw in the simulations, is that uh, order three and order two have like comebacks. Uh, so they, you know, you 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 believe that they're going away from order two as it go to the left. It goes away, but then whoop, it goes uh, in again. And the same thing with order three, you, you think it's going up, it's going down, going up, and then whoop, it appears again at the, at the edge. Uh, so that, that's something to, to keep in mind when you're doing the, your analysis in terms of, you know, any contamination from the orders. The other heads up that I wanted to give, the sauce background, we actually documented this uh, in JDOCs because this sauce background, it's, it's sufficiently, it's very small, but for, because we're doing precise transit observations, you need to remove it in order to not generate any dilution on your, on your transit spectrum and your final transit spectrum. Um, so we took some observations during commissioning of a background region and we produced like a, a smoothed version of that that we we gave in JDOX. It's in a it's in a box file, so you can download that and apply it in a post processing stage. Because the pipeline does not do this by default, so you have to do it in a post processing stage. You can you can remove this down to one percent actually, um, but if you need better than that, you know you can always add extra observations, you know, in regions around your target to get a mesh a direct measurement of the background. Uh, that that gives much better precisions, of course. Second heads up, second set of heads ups. The first one is that during commissioning, it was seen uh, that the wavelength solution of SOS uh, shifted by about a pixel from target to target. We have ideas on what this might be, uh, and and we're we're on this undergoing investigations, but we we see a general shift. Like it's just one pixel it might be important for your observations. So this is something that you have to take care on on your own as well, because this department doesn't take care of it. About uh, does not take care of this. And the second one is the wavelength solution in SOS. It's currently near wavelengths. Um, and all other instruments use vacuum. Uh, the difference is small. It's like from 20 to like a portion of a pixel. Um, but it might be significant for your work. So, you know, likely SOS will move to vacuum. So stay tuned to JDOX. But uh, uh, we've used transformations, like the classical transformations for this, and it works fine. So it's pretty good. Let me go to trace position movement. There's two kinds of trace position movements I want to make you aware. First, uh, the sauce trace seems to sometimes move slightly between the clear and the F277W exposure. If you remember, in JDOT, we, we caution you to, to do some those, these two exposures because these two, uh, the, the F277W blocks all the light except the one above about two microns. So you can you know uh, use this to, to play with the contamination, the contamination models uh, to order overlap models. <clears throat> and uh, the reason for this is that uh, the onboard mechanism has uh, a, uh, a little detail in which if it doesn't arrive within a certain threshold of the pupil wheel, so you remember we have to put like a, a, a dispersing element. If that dispersing element doesn't exactly go within a given threshold, it will try to readjust in the next exposure. So sometimes that happens. And sometimes that, and that produces like a, and that produces in the happy 14 data set, like a slight, uh, shift of the profiles uh, one on top of each other. Uh, this doesn't happen for in other data sets. For instance, in the ERO was 96 data set, it doesn't happen. You know, they, they, they think it's on one on top of each other. So that's, that's one heads up. The other one is that during observations, we have observed sometimes some drift. Uh, this, this is particularly the case for the HAT P14B observations. Uh, this is not related to the FGS, FGS centroids directly. Uh, because the FGS sent trace, as you see here, so in the top you have the movement of the traces in SOS, and in the bottom you have the FGS, the guide star movement. Uh, 
and you know the, this drift that you see in in sauces is not does not appear here. So the, this might be something to do with you know, maybe a little rotation that happens uh, on on the on this on the shape of the of the uh, of the trace itself. But it's something to monitor. We, in some data sets, it appears in some other it doesn't. I'm going to explain in this particular data set. Actually, there's also things that happen on uh, on the actual TSO. So in the actual TSO, there's actual signatures of some clear time dependent uh, systematics, and you can see here I'm showing the white light light curve. So I added all the light from order one and order two, and you can see that they're pretty similar. And this is what Everett was talking about before. Uh, we our, our belief so far we, we haven't investigated this in detail to tell you like this is it. Uh, is that it might be this this kind of tilt event, this different flavor of a tilt event. So some tilt, tilt events can last hours. Um, and this might actually be it. And the, the stringent uh, idea on this comes from the fact that you see the same time dependence on the systematics from order one and order two. Um, so, and, and particularly SOS is, is very, uh, it's very, um, it's very sensitive to, to, weak, to lens events because it has a, a weak, weak lens on the cross dispersion profile that creates this Batman or cat shaped uh, profile in the cross dispersion profile. So heads up that happens. Uh, but you know, a Gaussian process solved the, the case, solved, saved the day in this case. So uh, you, you go and have fun with this data set. In terms of saturation, uh, I wanted to mention that um, you're going to notice that the peak of the light curve signals to noise ratio. So here I'm showing light curves examples on the left. And on the right, on the bottom, I'm showing time on the x-axis, in the y-axis. So time goes uh, goes forward from the to the bottom. Uh, wavelength in the x-axis, and the colors show uh, flux variations. So you're seeing the transit in dark here as a function of wavelength and in time. And you see that the peak of the light curve signal to noise ratio is a different place than the blaze peak of the extracted spectrum, which is in the top. And this has to do with saturation. So saturation actually, what it does is that it creates like a, a, a cap on the signal to noise ratio that you can you can reach. And that's because if you go above saturation, the ramp does not take that into account anymore. So that creates like this this um, this little hill, flat hill on top. However, I also want to mention um, that we did see some interesting behavior on uh, nonlinearity. And how we're exploring this, it's by a simple thing. If you watch the previous day webinar on TSOs, I, I gave out, if you, if you want to go back and, and listen to that, you know, please go. But um, what we are doing is to, to measure, you know, the impact of nonlinearity is measuring the difference between two groups, uh, a certain set of groups, and then measuring the same difference at a different set of groups and taking the ratio of that. So in a perfect linear ramp, that should be one. So if you do, if I plot the ratio between difference between group, groups in the in the y-axis and the fluence of the group in the in the last group in the x-axis you should see something like this like the higher the fluence you should see uh, data accumulating around one on this ratio uh, and you know for the very first few groups that's more or less what you what you see but then even at the fourth group this is the three minus two group over the two minus one if you do five four minus three over three minus two you start seeing some deviation and that deviation happens around 35,000 counts. And you keep going for the rest of the groups, the, the thing just explodes. Uh, because, you know, the linearity only works until a certain point. Above that, we, we have it explored. And the interesting thing is that above 35,000 counts, more or less, uh, we, sh we see degraded TSO precision. So that's something that you have to, to keep in mind on these data sets. The other thing to keep in mind on this data and the nearest SAS data set uh, in particular, but also for in general, uh, has been shown is that if you want to compare precisions, try to do it on an end to end simulation that includes all the detector effects. So, for instance, here's uh, the, you remember the, the expected, like the measured scatter out of transit over uh, the expected scatter by the pattern out of transit that I showed before. Um, when you do it on, on simulated data, you get a, 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 a picture like this. This is not on sky, this is simulated data. And you see that it does not fall exactly on one because the pipeline has some, some trouble including one array of noise as a function of wavelength, for instance. So one array of noise, uh, it's an important component on, on, this, uh, on this expected per point scatter plots. And there's an extra level of uh, complexity with SOS uh, in which you have some quantum yield, yield effects that might enhance your error bars that the pipeline does not take that into account. I don't have time to go through this, but we have models for this, and the JLUST documentation, I think, explained this uh, at a very high level. There's some papers that you can exp explore. The basic idea is that um, uh, near SAS detectors, 
when uh, for short wavelengths like wavelength below two microns they might not produce one photoelectron per photon but more and that that yields an, an extra term of the variance so they're not exactly Poisonian random variables and actually or observe on sky it's it's actually spot on with the simulations of going back and forth it's going to spawn on with the simulations that we did, like the end-to-end -end simulations, you know, except for the for the order two when you have the short wavelengths, would you expect the quantum yield to be the, the strongest? So we do, we're starting to see some quantum yield effects, perhaps. We're exploring this. We have a technical report on, on the works to be user-facing. Um, but but keep this in mind when you're comparing your, your expected error bars, again, your, your observed scatter. Now let me jump quickly to the transit spectrum. Uh, as it was shown before for NIRSPEC and for NIRCAM, the same thing we observed uh, with nearest sauce. We observed slightly uh, diluted transit depth, and we're pretty sure it's the diluting companion. We're still investigating that, but the transit spectrum itself is pretty flat. Pretty flat. Uh, we we, are, uh, we uh, obtained 85 parts per million versus the variance in the spectrum, which is 92. So it's all within 10 and 20% from expectations again. And um, for order one, actually, what this is a very cool plot that I wanted to show. The y-axis, you see the transit depth error. And in the x-axis, you see the wavelength. And you see here predictions from Pandexo in, in, in gray and our end-to-end -end simulations in red. So this is also one, one key of caution as well, that the end-to-end -end simulations, you know, uh, are, I believe are the things to be compared against because there's several levels. So one is detector effects, but also the fact that we're doing like limb darkening stars, it's important, particularly for near stars, in which you see like a huge change in the limb darkening, for instance, and that, that impacts as well. And this is what we were mentioning on the enhanced uh, um, um, a error in the transit depth in the saturation region. Uh, we see an enhanced set of error on there, uh, which does not keep going down as you would expect in a non-saturated, but still, I'm pretty surprised this, does, this doesn't jump like widely. Uh, uh, so, so even in the saturation regime, we can extract pretty, pretty decent precisions out of this data, which is fantastic. Uh, the same thing goes for order two. It's also flat. Transit depth, uh, it's around 90 parts per million. The sector itself, it's also 90 parts per million, so it's within the expectations. And we see a similar thing. Um, the, it, it's consistent with our end-to-end -end simulations. Uh, see so this on sky and on black, the transit depth errors on the y-axis and wavelength. Um, so this is this looks very very promising uh, for your TSO needs. So uh, without further ado, I'm a little bit over the time. Uh, near soft sensitivity and studying for TSOs is excellent. Uh, heads up, going above 35,000 counts can lead to degraded TSO precision. So until we figure that one out, you know, please that suggestion is to not go above. But if you want, you can. You're free to do that with your observations. Uh, and interesting depth as a function of wavelength is flat, which is good. Good news for 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 TSOs.